If you're a, a visitor or if you're a local resident, you can't help but notice all the German fortifications built around the island. However, what you see is probably dwarfed by what's underground. Construction of this battery was started in 1941 and it was built in response to Hitler's concern that the British were going to attack the Channel Islands to retake it whilst the, German arm, the main German armies were busy on the Eastern Front fighting Russia. For the next two years, between 1941 and 43, the island was absolute hive of activity with the Germans constructing bunkers and fortifications. All this was being done in secret. The islanders wouldn't have known what was going on because this was all a military zone. Very much like what's a secret now underground. So let's go and have a look at what's underground. Okay, we're entering into the personnel bunker here. We've got two meters of concrete above our head, two meters in the walls. And as we come into the hallway, the main hallway of the bunker, we've got a crew room here on the left. So what's interesting about this crew room is that this is where 12 men would perform their duty. And in the event of imminent attack, they would actually stay in the bunker. Otherwise, they're coming on duty and going out to their barracks and billets every day. Behind me here, what we've got is the ventilation system. Um, and this is to protect the bunker and the soldiers inside against a gas attack. At the beginning of the, the Second World War, both Allies and Germans thought that they were going to use gas and the Germans went, you know, uh, they, they, they kitted out all their bunkers with uh, these protective measures. And essentially what they do is filter the uh, foul air that's come, being pumped in and then clean air leaks out uh, by overpressurizing the bunker. At this end of the room here, this gives you an idea of how the bunks would be set out for the crew. Twelve in here, and you can see they've also got their lockers, which they would, would have, they would have kept their possessions in there as well. The standard of this design of these bunkers uh, is the same wherever the bunker is built. So when you go into it, them, they, the rooms are identical. The first room that you'll come to is the NCO's room. This room currently has a display of uh, mines and minefields and on the wall there is a map of the whole of the battery and you'll see that this particular bunker here is one of, of four separate uh, emplacements and their associated bunkers. The next room is the commander's room and in here the display, the display you'll see a German artillery officer at his desk and from this room here he would be able to communicate with other uh, parts of the battery as well as headquarters which is situated in the centre of the island. And in this crew room here, we've got some displays of uh, German food sacks, German crockery, some telephone equipment. And at the end, what would be very dear to all the Germans who are stationed in this bunker is the boiler. Uh, this would have kept them warm in the winters and is connected even to radiators. And this is the way out of the bunker, the second exit. And as we go past here, we've got an example of a German artillery NCO uh, in his full kit. And up here, this is where we enter the major part of the complex and really see the, the extent of how much there is here. OK, let's get some light on down here. Here we've got a corridor linking from this point to the ammunition bunker around the corner there. If we look on the other side, here we've got another corridor going down to the other ammunition bunker at this, for this, this, this particular emplacement. Now what happened was that in 1941, when the Germans started constructing this, as we saw outside, there was an open emplacement using a First World War French artillery piece. By 1942, 
The Germans weren't happy with that. This gun was already 25 years old and really it wasn't fit for purpose as far as they were concerned. So this is the consequence of that. It, it, the whole emplacement, the whole battery got an update. And what happened were that the three bunkers, the personnel bunker, the ammunition bunkers, were all connected together by these underground corridors, reinforced so that troops could move around protected. They didn't even need to go on, onto the surface. And the major part of this update was the second emplacement, which is over here. And this emplacement would have housed the modern quick-firing turret gun, which the Germans would replace the French guns with. And underneath, we're now underneath this emplacement here, so we've got access for the crew up the steps into the, the, the gun pit. As we go around, basically this is a, a would have been a shelter for the crew in the event of attack with blast doors fitted to protect them. At the moment it's nicely fitted out as, as a display showing occupation, Red Cross, uh, supplies and, and deliveries. And as we go round this underground emplacement, each of these cubby holes in, in the wall here would have been stacked up with ammunition. In fact, there's a display here in this one of some, some dummy ammunition. And then the ammunition would have been loaded onto or into the gun pit by passing the shells up onto this contraption here. By winding it, it could be wound up so that the gun crew in the pit would then place them into the turret. So the crew of the, of the gun would have been very much protected um, rather than being in the open emplacement had this emplacement ever come into operation. The fact of the matter is it never did. By 1943, the Allies were attacking German factories, bombing them, and the guns which were going to be replaced, which were the replacement guns, never were delivered. They, they were never delivered. So this emplacement never was finished, the guns were never fitted, and it's very much like it would have been an unfinished project. So when we walk through here, doors were not fitted. And further around here, we've got the space for another gun uh, cartridge and uh, shell head loader, all ready to go but never fitted. This display here on, on the... Uh, on the, on the right hand side here, this display of, of very much what would have been regarded as, as rubbish at the end of the last war. There was so much German equipment uh, left on the island that it was literally pushed into tunnels, bulldozed in and left to rot. Many years later when they were finally cleared out there wasn't an awful lot left but you can clearly recognise things like helmets and gun mounts and uh, kitchen canteens and, and all sorts of other things. Really interesting little bit round here. This patch on the wall here, which uh, you've got some concrete which have been, has been chipped off. This is actually an unauthorised experiment from the, the Royal Engineers, the British Army Royal Engineers, from uh, when they were clearing up after the occupation. They thought, what would happen if we left a hand grenade on the side of the concrete? How much damage would it do? Well, you can see it did a little bit of damage, but not an awful lot. What's really interesting is that it, it shows the, the rebars, the, the steel network uh, encased within the concrete, which would have made it almost impossible to physically remove uh, this sort of, of concrete without chipping every single inch of it away. Uh, and that's why these, these, these bunkers survive. They're almost in, indestructible. Moving around a little bit further, We've got a, an obsolete French tank turret. Uh, these would be mounted on positions around batteries and around the coast of the island. Uh, essentially for one man, it meant that the man on sentry in the, the position, which was normally a pit, some, sometimes called a Tobruk in posi position, uh, would have had the armour of this turret protecting him. So he was pretty pleased because otherwise without that he would have had no defence, no def protective uh, uh, screen in front of them at all. And in this final cubby hole here we've got a searchlight 
which would have assisted the anti-aircraft guns, uh, which are also sighted on the battery. The battery had its perimeter against attack from the from the land, but it also had its protection against air attack with anti-aircraft guns supported by this searchlight. So as I was saying before, these tunnels here were an upgrade from what was there previously. So previously, the ammunition bunker, the personnel bunker would have been connected by trenches, and in order to provide that additional protection, what they did was actually dig them a little bit deeper, put concrete up the sides, and then put shuttering and pour concrete over the top. So what we've got is a pretty good protection for the crew as they're moving between the different parts of this particular position. These ammunition bunkers, they're standard design, two rooms, one like this and an identical one next door. One would have held the cartridges and one would have held the, sh the shell heads. Uh, now they're being used to, to display various artefacts and what's really interesting in this one is we've got two fantastic artefacts. One is this Ehrlichan cannon, 20 millimeter cannon. This would have been used for an anti-aircraft role um, and would have been used all over the island uh, as well as on ships. In fact, this one came off a, a ship uh, that was sunk and has been recovered by divers. Uh, interestingly enough, the Ehrlichan cannons Swiss made and they sold to both sides. Over here we've got a really interesting exhibit. This is a propeller uh, which has been salvaged from a downed Western Whirlwind aircraft. Now, Western Whirlwind aircraft are not very well known, uh, but had they reached their full potential, they might have become very much more well known. At the beginning of the, the Second World War, the British uh, Royal Air Force wanted a high-speed uh, fighter plane, uh, and the Whirlwind was designed uh, as that plane. It could go faster than the Spitfire, it had two engines, uh, and indeed, the RAF were really keen about uh, ordering this plane. They ordered a thousand, uh, but then decided no, they weren't going to uh, fulfil the order because they were concerned that the Spitfire production was going to be affected. So the, the order was cancelled, uh, and only a handful were, were made uh, and used for reconnaissance. These aircraft went into action mainly as a ground attack and an anti-shipping uh, aircraft and uh, they were certainly seen in action off Jersey on a number of occasions and unfortunately on one particular occasion this particular aircraft in November 1942 was downed and the pilot was killed. We're nearly at the end of our tour of Battery Moltke, but before we finish I just wanted to show you this emplacement from the outside. We were right underneath here when we walked around underneath and this is where that gun was never in place. The barrels there are actually not from this battery but were recovered uh, from at the bottom of the cliff where they were dumped at the end of the occupation. I hope you've enjoyed our virtual tour of Battery Moltke. And over the next few days, I'm going to take you to some other occupation sites where we're going to see more of this hidden world.